Welcome to Café Rollist. Thanks for joining us as this, I don't know, after lunch delicacy, early morning uh, breakfast thing if you are in the US East Coast. If you're in the Pacific, uh, I think it's the middle of the night. But today we are heading for Glasgow, am I right? Um, not quite, no. I'm near St Andrews on the East Coast. I lived in Glasgow for 11 years, which might be where I've got a bit of a Glasgow accent. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm in Scotland, which currently, looking out the window, is sunny. So that's a good start to the day. It looks sunny. We, we're breaking, uh, what, what do you call them, stereotypes today. It's sunny in London. Absolutely. Well, it's cloudy, but <laughs> and it's sunny in Scotland. <laughs> but I, I was led to think you might be around Sc uh, Glasgow, because we are here to talk about something which is Glasgow-based, am I right? Or at least it used to be? So... So Al Albacon um, is an online it's an online convention that uh, myself and a team of five others have have created. Now all of us live in Scotland, um, and uh, there is history of the name Albacon. It, there used to be a science fiction uh, convention in, based in Glasgow, so that might be the connection. Oh, okay. Um, um, called Albacon. Um, and there's also one in New York State as well called Albacon. Um, and we spoke to both of them before we announced the name um, to make sure they were comfortable with us using it, which they are, which is great. Um, and yeah, so it's, I think the because it's an online convention, yes, we are all based in Scotland, but it's the convention doesn't really have a base. You know, it's it's got a website and it'll have a Discord server and various sort of things. Yeah, Al Alba. Uh, for a moment, uh, when I first saw it, I was wondering it was if it was about w one of my other interests, which is the Spanish Civil War, because Alba is the acronym for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh -huh. <laughs> which was a, a group of U.S. Uh, concerned uh, veterans and citizens who went on to fight against fascism in Spain. So it's uh, but so Alba is it? Uh, pardon my it's, uh, ignorance. Historic. So it's a historic Gaelic name for Scotland. That's okay. that's its origin. Um, and when coming up for the name, so the name was actually one. So I, I also organised Tabletop Scotland, which is a physical, um, obviously in this in, in the olden days when we all used to be able to get together, uh, a physical convention um, which has been running for two years. Um, and now that Tabletop Scotland is established, I started thinking about right. Could it, could we organise another event? Um, but with us cancelling uh, Tabletop Scotland this year um, because of the pandemic, um, I decided to uh, create another convention entirely. And because I already had the name Albacon in mind, it made sense. Um, and particularly Mark, who's one of the other members of the team, he was the one who was nagging me to do it. So it was like, right, okay, so let's let's do it. Um, I, and I mean, I can talk all day probably about it, but it's um, the convention itself. So the website is www.albacon.co.uk. It's being held on the 3rd and 4th of October. We do actually technically have a bit of a Monday uh, element, the 5th of October element to that, because we have a 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. slot on the Monday. Um, because we're trying to be a worldwide event, essentially. We've created slots so, uh, so that the games can be run pretty much anywhere in the world. And we've already got a number of submissions from Canada, Australia, Denmark, Netherlands, um, and uh, the States, which is, which is great. Cool. Uh, well, actually, we, we jumped ahead in Albacon, but we did Sorry. not discuss... Yeah. No, it's fine. Uh, it's great. And, uh, who are you? Could you introduce yourself uh, a bit to the, the oh, listeners? Who am I? So because I don't I'm, e I'm, even I'm, myself. I don't know you that well, if at all. No. no. So I'm I'm Dave Wright. Uh, on Twitter, I'm known as a second chapter. Um, there's a whole backstory there, which I won't go into. But the I started gaming in '84. Um, we were on holiday um, as a family, myself and uh, two older brothers in York with my, with my mom and dad. And my brother Alan picked up a copy of the Dungeons and Dragons basic set 
uh, from what at that time was Games Workshop in York. Um, and it was the basic set that introduced me to, of D&D, &D, uh, was what introduced me to the hobby. Um, from there, I've played, particularly back then, games like Golden Heroes, Middle Earth role playing, the Star Wars West End Games edition, things like that. Um, a little bit of RuneQuest and other stuff. And I kept gaming pretty much until my early 20s. Yeah, until my early 20s. Mainly d and I think I've just kind of gravitated towards D&D. &D. Um, and then in my early 20s, I moved to Glasgow after finishing university and I stopped gaming. Um, I, but I bought lots of games. Um, and I think at one point I had something like 300 different rule books um, and things like that. And then about 16 years ago, we moved from Glasgow to where we are now, uh, near St Andrews. And rather than bringing all those books with me, I decided to sell them all. Oh no! Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't gaming at the time and I thought I'm moving to what is largely the middle of nowhere gaming is going to be very little little um but strangely enough that isn't that wasn't the case um so when we moved i think i kept um something like uh, half a dozen different things but the 300 plus books all went on ebay uh at the time which was painful but but necessary um and since then, I I used to own a brick and mortar retail store for uh, for games and comics. I had that for about three years, and then about six six seven years ago, I decided I wanted to run a convention. Um, uh, I also used to run or organise uh, a games club in Edinburgh uh, called Orc. Uh, Orc Edinburgh.co.uk is a wee plug for them, um, and they were a role-playing club that met up in cafes and pubs and all sorts of places in Edinburgh. And it was when I was doing that, and when I was seeing conventions pop up, particularly in England, um, I was like, "We need more in Scotland." Uh, we had, and we still have, a uh, compulsion in Edinburgh. Um, there used to be one in Aberdeen, and there's a board games event in Glasgow um, called Glasgow Games Festival. But there wasn't anything big. Um, and I went to Gen Con in 2014 in Indianapolis for my 40th birthday um, and went to Games Expo back when it was all just in the Hilton. Um, and I thought, and people started to dare me essentially to organize one. So that's where Tabletop Scotland came from. That's where the original idea came from. Um, and it, it took about three years to find a venue that ticked enough boxes, uh, where that was budget, location, logistics, um, the fact that they wanted us there. So we ended up in Perth for that, um, which has been great. Um, and that grew significantly. Um, I think we're now the fifth or sixth largest in the UK. I'm not entirely sure uh, if there is such a ranking system, but last year that had 1,600 unique attendees, which was 2,400 people over the weekend, which was fantastic. And within that, we ran just over 100 tables of role-playing games um, over those five slots. And that was when I thought, right, we could do a role-playing convention as well as Tabletop Scotland. Um, and that's when the idea of having something like Albacon came from. Um, I'm probably, <laughs> you've probably got lots of questions as I'm talking here, but um, I, I, I'm happy to keep going. The, the, the hey, it's perfect. Of... You're making my life much easier. You, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't want to be critical of some people I had on the show, but I had to spend a lot of energy lately coming up with a question, you know, to put back a coin in the Absolute. machine. So, so you, you keep Absolute. going, you keep going. It's perfect. <laughs> um, right about, I think it was March this year that... Uh, yeah, I was due to go to Aircon in Harrogate, um, which is one of my kind of standards. So I, I, at the start of the year, I always kind of work out which conventions am I going to go to. Um, so Compulsion in March, Aircon in March as well, um, Expo, um, naturally. 
uh, if I can justify the cost, uh, Gen Con, um, uh, and then obviously Tabletop Scotland, which is at the end of August normally. Um, and I've yet to make it to Dragon Meat. Um, uh, yeah, other, other Dragon other Meat is the thing. Huh? It's. Uh... I know, I know. I, I think because it's in London and it's a one day event. Um, I would have to travel down on the Friday and come back on the Sunday. And it's like, well, actually, that's probably still worth it. So the plan for this year, obviously, I, I, we don't know if Dragon Meat will absolutely go ahead this year, but the plan is to go this year, um, if only to stop people nagging me for not going. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will um, be... In, okay, but, um, I'm, I'm writing this down in my agenda. If you're not coming, <laughs> I will be nagging you. Thank you, because I, I, I really should go, if only to, well, there's friends naturally in this in this hobby. You you meet people at conventions and you meet you talk to people online, and the only chance you, you can really get to meet them is at conventions. Um, and there's quite a lot of people that I know that go to Dragon Meet every year that I know through Twitter, but I haven't met yet. And I'd love to be able to meet up with them. That'd be great. Um, so I think the... In, in, in March was when we had a conversation with Expo about them looking to postpone and they wanted to, to postpone table, uh, their event to August, which classed with Tabletop Scotland, which meant we would move to October. But it became very clear that actually Tabletop Scotland in October it wasn't really something that we felt was doable. Uh, having, you know, essentially fit 1,600 people in a building uh, close together playing board games and role-playing games didn't feel right. That was when Mark, in particular, uh, from, the t from the Albacon team, uh, approached me about doing something online. So that's that's where Albacon kind of really started from. Um, I've So that's 3rd and 4th of October, as I said, albacon.co.uk, and we've already had over 40 RPGs submitted, as I say, and the, but the thing I haven't mentioned is for Albacon, it's for charity. Um, so I think the beauty of online is to organize an online convention, the cost of doing that, other than time and effort, is very small. Um, and we're absorbing that cost as a team. Um, so all all RPGs are going to have a price associated with them, and the, av the average we're looking at that is five pound. But all of that money is going to go straight to our charity, which is uh, is good to give. Which is uh, a charity that specialises in supporting young people with cancer <clears throat> and their families, um, which is something that's particularly dear to Mark's heart because his son has has gone through leukemia, is still going through leukemia, and had lots of support. And I think it's one of these lesser known charities particularly in scotland it's very it's lesser known as a scottish based charity um but it's one of these things that we just thought well we we're not in this to make money so why not just give all the money to charity which is what we're going to do and i'll Amazing. <laughs> so did you try some other online conventions because there's been a few to see all they were doing things and uh, managing yeah. and what sort of interface they had with people? Yeah, so Mark went to the DCC, the, the, Drag the Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, convention, Bulb from the team has been to Onyx Paths um, online convention, I went and I took part in D&D &D Live. Um, not as a streamer, but as just playing the game. And I think the... I'm... So I, as, as the guys who have worked with me so long on Tabletop Scotland know, I I tend to focus on the, right, how does this all work, rather than the, am I having fun type thing when I go to something like this. Um, I remember at Aircon a few years ago, Duncan shouted at me uh, because I was too busy looking at how it was operating rather than enjoying myself. Um, but the, the thing with D&D &D Live and the other events that we mentioned, it was really just looking at, yes, playing games. And I played in three sessions at D&D Live, which was great fun. And, but also just seeing how logistically they, they made it work using Discord really effectively, um, using their 
signing portal not that effectively because they had different table numbers on their website to what was in Discord, which caused all sorts of confusion. Um, so little things like that, they became, right, okay, we want to avoid these pitfalls. We'll learn from this. And there were similar challenges with the other events I mentioned that Mark and Bob went to. And it was really just seeing, right, let's work out how best to do this. And since the lockdown, I mean, I've not played any of these board games that are on my shelves behind me, but I've been playing D&D on uh, Roll20, Star Wars, Age of Rebellion on Roll20. Um, I've been looking at having a Knights Black Agents game on Roll20, and it's just really seeing how easy it can be. Um, and it's it works. I, I was a big skeptic of it beforehand. I'd never tried it before, and but it works, which is great. Yeah, it was a, the discovery for a lot of us. I think I had played a couple sessions as part of streams, but uh, I had not run them myself. And I think not only we are all discovering a lot of tools available to play role-playing yes. games online, but what I've seen and heard of quite a bit since the beginning of the lockdown is that a lot of people are developing new tools or bringing to tabletop yes. role-playing games tools they use at work. So I was introduced yeah. to something called Miro, which is not done done at all for yeah. for playing but it's great for smaller games indie games where you just need to share some some visual ads and and you need things to be quite simple but uh yeah actually it, you know this this conversation reminds me something i had planned to do uh early in the lockdown since i took part to a couple of conventions including a french one called cyberconf and i had people organizing those conventions on, on this show I need to organize a little online panel with people from different organizations to see if there are lessons to be exchanged because it's quite fascinating how one was focused about the trade holes, trying to create a platform online yes. for for sellers because it was all about supporting their local community of crafters and people in the t tabletop industry selling stuff at convention. Another one was a lot about panels and they had a, a live radio going on almost all day on Twitch interrupted yes. by panels and then you, you had others which are strictly gaming. So it's quite it's quite fascinating. It's the heyday of that. So people are experimenting and finding out what works and what doesn't work. It's it's a bit clunky sometimes, but it's very exciting I find. Yeah, and I mean we're using Zoom just now and I so for my day job uh, I use Zoom almost since, since since i started working from home full time i use zoom all the time um but it's a, actually a very useful tool in general uh, it's become a way for me to connect with my family who obviously i haven't spent any time with and friends that i don't see very often but you can use it during role playing you can share screens you can do all sorts of things um but the but Miro is is one I've I've used in the day job, but I I hadn't actually considered using it for gaming until I think I read a blog post about it, and it's just it's, it is really just seeing right well, what can you use. There was there was one thing that Sly Flourish makes you he retweeted about called Owl Bear Rodeo, um, which is a bizarre name for anything, um, but it's a very light bit like browser based but very light tape, virtual tabletop it's got a dice roller in it you can put tokens on a map it doesn't have any other integration yet but it's it's very cool but yeah you, we are seeing essentially an innovation of what you know of these tools and how people can use them um which is which is great um because it it's proven that it works now and i think more and more people are using it and even after lockdown finishes or the pandemic is kind of safe, exactly. If ever, if ever that's the case, um, then I still think that online gaming will be a thing. It'll be. A, I suspect I will continue to do some of my gaming online. I'll revert to face to face for probably my D and D game that I run because that's where it started. Um, but the other games that I've been looking at will, will stay online, um, which is because it's convenient as well. Uh, I don't need to drive somewhere to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm quite I keep wondering how I mean it's a, it's been my experience that there were quite a few people I knew online because they also have podcasts or because they they're designers 
and I, I never had an opportunity to play with them because they're because they're busy, because they live in other places. And yep. the ability to play online has allowed me to play with them, even play on a regular basis. Uh, sadly, Origins Online, for for good reasons, well, uh, did not take place. For and our, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean the the reason the, the reason to cancel it were good. The the fact that this was yes, needed to yes. be cancelled was bad. Absolutely. Uh, uh Absolutely. it's uh, it's really sad and uh, i really hope uh th things will get better moving forward but uh, as a i was planning to yeah because that's another opportunity actually play testing for designers so i'm designing my very first game uh i was planning to try to go to convention but it's money it's time i got a young child or do i manage that we don't have family support here to take care of him and uh, yeah, now I'm pr considering coming to uh, Albuquerque online. Uh, I'm gonna do Virtually Expo, and each time I've got a guest from the US, I tell them, "Have you considered coming to Virtually Expo?" And now I will tell them, "Go to Albuquerque." Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So and, and, and we do have two two games on the schedule, um, and I'm going to forget their names. Uh, so apologies to the GMs, uh, which are actually their their own systems, their own games that they've written, and we we also not yet on the schedule but we do have a number of playtest scenarios which are being written for published games i won't name them until they're scheduled um so it, it's it is designers are seeing that opportunity as well and i mean you touched on um other events that have done video content we are looking at uh, creating some video content for the for albacon there's an element of making sure we can walk before we try to run though it's it's you know we are as a team none of us are streamers none of us have done this before um so it's very much right we could have we could attempt to do something really big and do it not very well or indeed fail and i'd rather not do that um so we're we're speaking to a number of different designers um from like the DMs Guild, there's lots of UK based people in the DMs Guild. We're also speaking to publishers, so we've already got a number of publishers on board as supporting us, like Chaosium, Pale Green, Handiwork, Pinnacle, um, and a number of other companies like Serenscape who are providing support. Um, and we'll announce that in more detail when we're ready to do that. But those have all kind of come on board as, yeah, we see what you're trying to do. We see it's for charity. And we want to support you, uh, which is great. And for some of those, for example, Handyworker doing the, a new edition of A State, which was an RPG that came out, I can't remember when, um, but it came out years ago. And they're redoing it using Forest in the Dark, uh, so the Blaze in the Dark system. Oh, nice. I um, love it. I'm playing it so, tonight. And that, and excellent, excellent. So the I happen to know John, who runs Handywork, um as a friend and i ha also happen to know the two designers as friends as well so it's leveraging that network and saying right can we have an interview a video interview on a state uh and they all went yes i was like great so we'll record pre-record that and we'll uh release it probably in the run-up to the convention as part of you know the build-up to it so i think there's, there's things like that that we're looking to do um similarly we'll do something with pale green and pinnacle and others um just to um recognize the support they're giving us well streaming is but yeah it's a huge endeavor yeah. and i mean like like anything it is. if you want to do a lot of things also uh, you need to have the team for that with people with different specialities and i mean it's from i, I guess a physical convention you've got you got health and safety. You got the catering. You got the board games. You got the the, the role playing games. You've got organizing the panels. You've got the, the promotional aspect. So it's yep. it's a lot of different stuff. Uh, have you considered? I don't know. Maybe getting in touch with people like Encounter Roleplay, who have a foot in the UK and are specialized in streaming. Um, so we are actually speaking to uh, a couple of streamers oh, um, and kind of role play are one are one of them, um, but I think the I think right now, well, so yes, we would love to have anyone who wants to stream something to stream it over our weekend. If I put it as simple as that, I think I go back to my walk before we run type thing. I want to make sure that as a convention, you know, the nuts and bolts of people playing games works. If we can add things over and above that, that would be fantastic. 
I mean, of course. At, yeah. at Tabletop Scotland, we had lots of panels. We had films which we've shown. Uh, we had a UK premiere of the Eye of the Beholder Dungeons and Dragons art film, Whoa. which was released at Gen Con in, in 2018. We showed it last year at, at Tabletop Scotland uh, because I spoke to the design the uh, producers uh, when I was at Gen Con in 2018, and it was just easy to do that. Whether we would do something like that with this, I don't know. Um, but we will have some video content. We have a list of about, I think it's 20 topics that, that we could do something with, but I don't know if we want to commit to doing 20 videos. Um, so we'll we'll see how this lands. And we've had, again, fantastic support from lots of individuals who work within the industry and gamers who just want to, to help us. Um, which is great. And if I haven't replied to your email yet, it's, I, I will do that this week because I'm on holiday this week. <laughs> <laughs> you should rest. <laughs> you should play. Uh, um, <laughs> it, it, well, I should, I should play more. You're right. Um, but the, I think the, the rest thing is when I, when Tabletop Scotland cancelled and then doing this, a uh, number of people just look at me and go, do you not like free time? Uh, it's just, well, I do, I do like free time, but this is what I like doing with my free time. Um, so, so yeah, so th th this is this is something that, and and it's not just a one-off. We will be doing this again um, in 2021. It's, it's something that I think we're building something that's got momentum, uh, which is great uh, and onwards essentially. I'm very curious to see. Yeah, what's, what's going to be the 2021 editions of all of that that we see this year? Uh, see, uh, yeah, which one will be ongoing, which one won't, which one will improve uh, from the lessons learned? What will be the lessons learned from one another again? Because you, you, you see things Absolutely. which become standards over time, but that, that be, they become improvements. Uh, will some of these conventions will take place both physically and online, maybe at the same time, and have the two merge with one another it's no one knows <laughs> it's exciting exactly and, and these are these are scenarios that we've talked about for 2021 of abacon it's like right would we do would we just make it online again or would we have a meshed event and have no idea how a meshed event would work um but you know it's things like that but right now no one really knows no one has the real experience of doing this uh, that everybody else can go and speak to. Uh, before we did Tabletop Scotland, I spoke to Richard and Tony at Expo and said, right, tell me what I need to know. And uh, Tony uh, was very direct. And we, I, I went, he had a list of questions. And I think for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, he grilled me on all these things that uh, we had to make sure we had done for Tabletop Scotland. And we got to the end of the 40 minutes and I'd answered all these questions. I think I maybe made up two answers, but the rest of them I had answers for. Um, and and he was like, right, okay, it sounds like you know what you're doing. How can we help you? But there is, there is no resource really like that for virtual conventions, um, certainly not at scale. Um, you know, there's a lot of smaller uh, virtual conventions that have been running um, like uh, Con Plus and historically Aethercon, but they tend to be 20 to 30 games as opposed to we're aiming for approximately 100 games more if we can do that. Um, and But the beauty of online is it is scalable very easily. I don't need to worry about, I've only got this amount of space to fit this number of tables and chairs in. Um, we can have lots of different games we need to make sure that our Discord server is strong enough for this and things like that. But but yeah, I'm, we're confident that this will work. Hopefully not too confident. <laughs> Touching wood as I see these things. Well, <laughs> mi mistakes are, are lesson learned uh, as long as nobody gets Absolutely. gets hurt. But uh, it, it's work. It's, 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 it's online still a lot of work. Work is still there. Uh, I remember I invite you to check the, the couple Café Rollist I recorded with CyberConf. Uh, the French one, right. and one of the person I had, she was in charge of uh, moderation, and uh, uh, she had a cybercom in France was a very impressive thing because it happened very early on. Uh, a, con a French convention got cancelled, and there were a few others which were not binded to happen, and it was sort of a, uh, again that's one of 
the one I'm curious to see the next edition of because the first one was a true little miracle uh, involving designers, streamers, podcasters, but mainly organizers of conventions, of different conventions, coming together to improvise something in within three, maybe four weeks. And wow. But it, what was really impressive and... <laughs> Uh, I love, uh, but I love to hate also the French. Uh, God knows they they can be uh, quite conf confrontational when you you enter the the realm of managing something. Uh, not only the management team, but the the community as well can be uh, uh, not as uh, as polite <laughs> as in the UK might be in the UK. But uh, they did manage to pull something off and mainly to bring together the talent, again, diversified talent of an, a number of people. And it was just really, really impressive. I'm very curious to see a second edition of this one. And I really hope they, they will somehow uh, share that their experience uh, with, with others. Because at the same time, it's like I'm frustrated because I'm like, this has been my favorite so far of online convention, but I cannot share it really with the English speaking audience because it's not it's not um, yeah. it's not working for them uh, what was I gonna to say uh, I will go off into something and then I, I run out of, of question you know one thing <laughs> I, one thing I find fascinating also is how technology might catch up with this and bring us with more tools which again won't be developed for us because we are too little a market tabletop role playing game industry and even convention organizer but i remember attending yep. the uh uh the what is it called um the big conventions about science fiction which travels around the world uh so oh yeah world so Worldcon. con world um, con there was yeah. one in there was the one it was in dublin i think last year um, yeah and yeah, there's been in one in london six maybe seven years ago yeah, yeah, it moves around the world. Uh, but but yeah. there, there was, I remember at least one person who was there in telepresence, but he was attending the con from uh, Australia, Australia, and he, he had these, well, people might have seen videos of them, but it's like a robot on wheels, like on a Segway, and where the face would be, right. it's a screen, and like we are chatting now on Zoom. He was doing that, but while rolling around the convention and at the same at the, at the time it was like oh it's a it's a bit quaint uh, at the same time it's very heartwarming because I, the person uh, had some uh disability so it was really a way for that person yep. to attend convention so that was amazing and again that that's something also which is great with online convention we got a, another audience who's uh, able to to join us and, and enjoy it more fully but yeah it was something quaint then but who knows, yes. in two, three, five years, as this kind of equipment becomes somewhat common, maybe in, in other professional environment, suddenly you can rent them out like you rent tables and chairs for or screens or DVD player, and maybe they, they become a, a site you, we get used to. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. I mean, I think the one, one of the things I, I noticed, um, this was several years ago, but the the number of conventions that we have within the UK, as I say, when I when I was looking originally, there was lots in England, very few in Scotland, um, and I think on average there's one every other week uh, in England. Um, now that's different sizes and scales. These are all physical cons back then, but I wonder how much busier that convention calendar is going to become. Um, you know, as you were saying, will these virtual conventions continue? Will so the ones that happen at, at the Garrison, um, so North Star and Furnace, they've all moved online this year. Will they do both next year? Question mark. Uh, it's it's the and the technology that we're all u getting used to. Um, video. I mean, I'd never used Discord until um, you know starting my own game on it, and it's it's trying to work out how much more technology is out there and how can we make it better? Uh, either by, I mean, in the case of Roll20, I don't use a lot of the functionality, but I want them to get their system better. So I've signed up for a subscription for it because they need money to make their system better. And it's the same for other things like that. It's like to give these companies an opportunity to improve. 
they need time and investment, uh, which in this industry is quite hard to get that kind of investment without going to Kickstarter and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I can see over the next, certainly over the next six to 12 months, online conventions will continue to be, um, continue to happen. I do wonder if they may start to dip off after that period when normal life returns, as it were. Um, I mean, Gen Con has moved online this year. I was supposed to be going uh, this year, but we've obviously put that on, on hold. Um, I do plan to go next year if it happens. Uh, but they've been quite clear that they can't replicate you know, an event that 65,000 people per day attend as an online event. That's just not possible. But what they'll try and do is replicate as many events as possible, and they'll have an exhibitor zone how they're going to do that is not entirely clear and the challenge that Richard and Tony have for Virtual Expo is the same, you know, it's a large event how do you do that online? Well, maybe that's the point, you don't you do something else online because you can't mirror it exactly it's, it's one of the reasons why Tabletop Scotland didn't go online was it's predominantly a board gaming convention that has you know, a hundred tables of role playing over the weekend as well, but it's predominantly a board gaming convention. Board gaming, you can do a lot of it online, but do it as a convention online feels a bit weird to me. Um, so that's why we haven't done that. Um, but thankfully, we haven't done that because if we had, I wouldn't be doing Alvacon uh, because uh, I, I only have so much brain power and the uh, stress levels that I can handle. I understand the the that the board game the or board game slash video game industry it might not be as profitable as other things but I, I was a bit uh, I, I started playing board games online with my brother who was in Paris and my mother who was uh, yeah. still in Belgium and uh, on one hand it's great to play Splendor with them but on the other hand yes. it's so buggy there's so many issues The it's just bad uh, and you would think doing something like splendor which is not i don't know it's not the most it's complicated, not complicated thing and and it's crashing the user interface is, is difficult to navigate and when you want to play with older people like your parents or i guess if you would try with children it's it's really a pain and it's 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 really something i wonder if the board game industry will try to catch up with or maybe they won't because there's just not meaningful money to to make in there i mean for yeah. instance I on mean, steam splendor i've been playing it with a copy of splendor on my steam account and playing it with other people and it and it's not very good and i've been playing it with shared screen function which is in steam and you can use it with games but it's kind of using using it in spite of the game. The game is not, yeah. Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, customized to work with that. So it's it's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean there, there are online platforms. Mostly there are for role playing. There's Board Game Arena, which has lots of different publishers who are directly supporting it. Um, and there's Tabletopia, I think. Um, and then there's Tabletop Simulator, which is much more uh, graphical, intense, um, which is available through Steam. But Tabletop Simulator, what I've, what I've seen over the last, certainly the last kind of three months, is a lot of people who are developing games, I'll go back to your playtest reference, are pushing their game onto Tabletop Simulator um, and using that as a playtest avenue because they're not able to go to conventions to playtest their board games. Um, and that that's that's working. It's, I think for me, uh, and it sounds weird that I I do role play online and I get the social interaction through this through the video chat and the voice chat, but board gaming f would feel it just feels. I need to be around a table for board games for me, you know. Yeah, um, there's a physicality the to it. The, ta the, ta the tactile aspect of it. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's convenient with. Uh, I guess the. Uh, there's probably a lot of people in that circumstance, uh, but it's convenient with parents who are not into. I mean, tabletop role playing. You role play and you you story tell and you do all these things, which are I try to do it with my parents, uh, with 
more or less degree of failure. Uh, I know other people, I've read stories of other people who were very successful with it with their grandmother or parents, but that's not the case with me. So playing something like Carcassonne or, or Splendor yeah. is much more uh, beyond the user interface, which is crap. Uh, it's it's much more manageable and you still... It's nice to have... Yeah, I, I'm not great at having conversations with my mother. My mother is not a great <laughs> conversationalist. So having something you do while you, you chat and you tell about what is being going on, it's nice to have this touch point without... Uh, without having, okay, we're on the phone now, so we need to find something meaningful to talk about, or we just bore yes. each other to death. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a, a routine now with my parents where we have a Zoom, no, actually, no, they uh, use uh, FaceTime um, to have a catch up with them every, roughly every, every fortnight, but we do it almost like we're having dinner together. So they're having their dinner and we're having oh, our dinner. Nice. Um, so, and that, that works. Um, we don't play games with them. I've, we, we've played the odd board game. I think the other benefit of board games um, when it comes to introducing people is if you choose the right one, which is a big challenge in itself, but they usually only last about half an hour, 45 minutes. Whereas introducing someone to a role-playing game yeah. can at times, it requires a bit more conceptual stuff that they have to get their head around. Um, and whilst you can role-play for short periods of time, whether it's 50 minutes, an hour, or whatever it is, I think there's an element of the commitment time-wise for role-playing is a bit higher. Um, and, I, and I say that as a role-player first, you know, because that was the origin of my, of my interest. But board gaming is convenient. I can just grab one of these things off the shelf and I can play a game for an hour. And I'm not currently because of the pandemic, but you know I could theoretically do that. Um, but the it's the sort of thing that uh, there it's much easier accessible from that point of view. Um, but role playing games are uh, are what my initial kind of gaming passion was, which is you know why actually I've, I've almost reverted to that as part of the pandemic because it's easier for me to play that online uh, than it is i get i get almost the same experience uh doing that online whereas with board games i don't so yeah. that's why i'm role playing i think also board game they they leave the space open for conversation why in role playing game the conversation is the game so you don't actually you socialize Absolutely. but at the same time you don't exchange information regarding what's actually happening <laughs> outside of, of the game. So I really miss, for instance, playing poker uh, because, I, well, at the moment I don't have time, but uh, for a while, I actually, yeah, actually uh, I was contacted back by our poker group in Brussels. So my wife played again a, a bit with uh, uh, the friends we had uh, from from there. But I told poker is one of those games you, you're having the conversation as a new, as an ad Absolutely. added layer to um, to the, to the game. Absolutely. So what is a social event at that point? You know. No, so, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, wh what have you been playing lately, or are you planning to run? Are you going to run anything at Albacon, but or you will be too busy running in between? Uh, chat rooms to, so to I, manage things so yeah so as a team we've kind of we've kind of discussed this and, and we've worked on we're going to what we're going to do is when we get closer to um you know on the online ticket purchasing and indeed the convention itself so the on, online tickets for this will go live on the 21st of august i think it is yeah 21st of august um which conveniently is and originally would have happened so timing it from a, a marketing point of view on that basis but, but it's also when virtual expo is happening um but the as a team we've kind of gone right we're going to work on the assumption that none of us are running anything until we see the schedule and if there are gaps i.e for example if there's no star wars uh, games and i could run age of the empire or age of, age of rebellion that's easy enough for me to do so i could run a couple of games of that um, Oliver, he's he's a big cipher um, uh, fan, so he could run something using the cyber si cipher system. Um, and it's looking at it'll be about filling gaps, as in the sense of not gaps in the schedule, but gaps from the selection of games available. Um, but 
as you say, I suspect that a lot of our energy will need to be around on the facilitation of the event. You know, making sure players are getting to their game. Um, Because if someone joins the wrong section in Discord, um, as was demonstrated in D&D Live, they need moderators to manage that. Uh, And similarly, we'll need to moderate just in case someone misbehaves. Um, We have a fairly, what I think is a fairly strong code of conduct. We're mandating uh, safety tools as part of all of the role-playing games. It's, It's making sure that people are comfortable and we'll need to moderate Discord and monitor certain things to make sure that people are. Um, touch with nothing untoward happens, but we need to be prepared just in case something does. Um, so it's things like that that we'll be doing, I think, in the main over the weekend. Uh, but I suspect some of us will run games. Um, I mean, not on the basis that I'll probably be too focused or too concerned about, is it all working? Um, but hey... One one thing I remember from CyberConf, I think what they did is that they had, they, they had a moderation team and they had a information team, and I think it was something like the moderation team was Team Unicorn and uh, the information team was <laughs> Team Phoenix, but they had badges on their names uh, on Discord, the individuals, so they would go in from chat room to chat room, and apparently it was quite efficient as. A bit like having your local Bobby patrolling your street. <laughs> it was inc- it was helping to have people feel safe, and uh, for for conversation to tone down just when someone with the badge would uh, would show up uh, in the Discord. Do you yeah, have I any- think something like that is probably what we'll look at. Um, I'm trying to make it so that the. It, we're not we don't become a disruptive presence you know yeah. by kind of you know but at the same time the, the people know that we're there so it's finding that balance which you know we'll we'll learn that i think this year as much as anything else do you have a feel uh, maybe i don't know based on your physical convention of what's going to be the proportions of games or is it a lot of indie games a lot of uh, established game for I'm always looking for a good term for that. Your you know your modifiers Cubicle Seven per yeah, per grain, yeah. uh, or is it going to be uh, 60 80 percent of uh, the the big house uh, with the dragon <laughs> and the dungeon? So uh, for I think probably 40 percent D and D. Um, in year one, it was a higher percentage of D&D versus everything else. But in year two, we, well, I kind of pushed harder on uh, getting more variety. Uh, we kept our D&D Adventurers League. We focused on Adventurers League for the, the Tabletop Scotland. For Albacon so far, we've got games of Alien, uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics, quite a few D&D games, and we are looking at... Um, a adventurous league on the basis that because of D&D Live they'll, and because we're in October and the new book will be out we should be able to attract players who want to play in that storyline uh, as well so that's kind of where that will come from but we've got Fate Cthulhu, both Call of Cthulhu and Trail of Cthulhu in the list City of Mist, uh, some Traveller both Classic and Mongoose um, some Wifrip. Um, I know some games of Soulbound going to be getting the Age of Sigmar RPG from Cubicle 7. Um, Swords of Serpentine. Uh, Kevin Culp, I think he wrote the game for uh, Pelgrain. And uh, we have some World of Darkness currently. Mage is the main one at the minute. Uh, but Bulb is uh, speaking to a lot of people within the World of Darkness community. And similarly, we're speaking to creators from that community as well uh, to see you know if if we if we can't necessarily get a in with the publisher then we can have someone like Matthew Dawkins who is who came up and supported Tabletop Scotland and ran events at, at Tabletop Scotland he may be and I've already spoken to him uh, we need to fine tune what exactly he's going to be involved in but having Matthew involved in running games would be a good draw as well um, and and suppose in some respects we're happy for not in some respects entirely uh, we are happy for people to run anything. Uh, we go through an approval process when the game is submitted. So I look at it, and then one of the other t- members of the team looked at it, and we just go right. Are we comfortable that this is a game that we will host? Um, 
and all of the games have tags so to do with the content to make sure that people know what the game is um so whether it's got adult themes or where it's a sci-fi um space opera or whatever it is just making sure that those kind of things are clear uh, from the game uh, and it's trying to make sure that it's it, we have a diverse as much a diverse lineup of games but also ideally a diverse lineup of attendees and gms you know so we, it, we're trying to do that it's um it's part of the it's part of the bigger challenge i think from an online convention is especially a new online convention is trying to get people to come and speak to us and run games for us um but i think we're leveraging every part of our networks that we have to to make that happen at the minute which is great and um tw twitter has actually become a, it was a place where I largely just broadcast. Now uh, the interaction levels that we're seeing are really very high, and Twitter is like any social media. You can, depends on the day. It can be a good thing or a bad thing to be on. Um, but right now, our engagement on Twitter has been really positive. Lots of writers for um, DMs Guild and who pub self publish on Drive Through and places like that. Um, they are coming to us and offering support, um, both from the point of view of giving away free copies um, to our attendees or our GMs. That's great, um, but we actually need games. You know, we are a games convention first and foremost. Um, so if we're able to have a wider, diverse of games, the the greater range of people we'll have coming to it. Um, we're also speaking to the Pathfinder Society as well in, in the UK. Um, I, was, I, I was playing a game of Eberron on Saturday night with uh, Rich Green, who works for Cobalt Press, or writes for Cobalt Press, and Ian Hawthorne, who is um, one of the head guys for the Pathfinder Society in the UK, uh, but he also has written for D&D. And um, the two of them have also provided me lots of names to speak to, to basically say, right, you know, let's go and you know, speak to this guy, that guy, whoever, um, and we'll we'll see, or, or this this woman, or this person of color, or whatever it is, just to make sure that you know, as a as a white guy with a beard, I want to make sure that you know I'm not the convention. You know, it's it's kind of you know we we want the convention to be open to everybody, no matter um, you know their gender, their their kind of. A capability or otherwise anybody can come to the convention and Amaz we want games to reflect that amazing i guess the part of the challenge is well at this point you you i i assume you don't have means to know whether your audience will be a new audience or how much of your physical convention audience will manage to draw onto the online realm um i think we'll get some of the tabletop scotland audience um largely because um i control all the social media for tabletop scotland um <laughs> so i'm, I'm <laughs> um but i'm i've promised the uh, uh, duncan john and simon that i won't you i won't abuse that i'll use it but i won't abuse it um so the real uh, which hat am i wearing um so <laughs> we'll we'll be targeting uh, people that we know go to conventions already. So naturally, because I have uh, access to that community, um, I'm talking about Alpacon uh, through, I do a, a Friday post sometimes in the morning or the afternoon on the Tabletop Scotland kind of Facebook group, just to kind of ask how everybody's doing. I've been doing that since the pandemic started. Um, and w every so often I'll talk about Albacon, i.e. this is what I've been doing this week type thing, uh, just to generate a conversation. Um, but we've had a, lump, a number of our, certainly for the Adventurers League stuff for Dungeons and Dragons, a number of the DMs that we had for that at Tabletop Scotland have put their hand up to run games for us at Albacon, which is great. Um, and our kind of main facilitator or um, cat herder uh, for for Adventurers League is also do, for Tabletop Scotland is also doing that for uh, Albacon as well so Greg who's not part of the core team but um, uh, I talked him into doing this so uh, because he's not doing it for Tabletop Scotland this year I think there is 
we we've we've hit on a time as well. Uh, looking at the calendar um, before we went public, it was very much a, what do we want to avoid. Uh, and I think Furnace is the the weekend after us, um, but there's no other convention in the UK that I'm aware of anyway uh, that is happening at the same weekend. But having, you know, we'll 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 get what we get. I think we'll have about a hundred games on the schedule, maybe a hundred and twenty if we're lucky. And if you average that at five players per game, then we're talking you know five hundred to six hundred people, which should be great. Yeah, um, and the the good news is that you you don't have to too much to worry about the size of your trade all because it, it's flexible. You can shrink it yes. or expand it. Yes, yes, and we'll we'll use Discord for a variety of things. You know, for ex exhibitors and or virtual exhibitors essentially to uh, promote their wares. Uh, and we we have a number of different companies who have approached us about that. Uh, a lot of independent producers of kind of accessories um, and I mean, some of them we've already listed on our website so all rolled up uh, who are uh, very well known within the UK convention scene um, so uh, Phil and Paul they're, they're supporting us and they'll be involved at some point through the weekend um, and it's just finding ways to support a lot of these smaller companies in particular, you know, because they don't have conventions to go to, to, to make money from. So it's making sure that we're able to support them as much as possible as well. Amazing. Well, I think we're going to close, uh, but uh, because in four minutes, the sign up for <laughs> another convention, online convention, the Gauntlet Community Open oh, yes, Gaming yes. is opening in four minutes and there are a few games there I really want to be among the <laughs> first to sign up for some Passion well, I, de la Passion. I won't keep you from that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah well, I hope maybe some designers from the gauntlet for, uh, from that community will show up at Albacon uh, that would be awesome. Be uh, what I will do as soon as I'm signed up for gauntlet so first of all people hearing this and going to the gauntlet please sign up to my two sessions of my game, Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventorying. It's just two hours, it's very humoristic, and so far, everybody who plays tested it, it had fun. Uh, if you cannot go to the gauntlet, as soon as I'm signed up for the gauntlet, I will uh, go sign up some of sessions, some sessions of Paris Gondo for Albacon, so hopefully you'll be able Thanks. to find me there. If Dave Wink, wink. I'm winking on camera for people who don't have the, the video. Uh, <laughs> approves my games. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure that'll be possible. Hopefully so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, where can people find you? What's your final word? Uh, and yeah, this is this is goodbye. Thank you so much, Dave. No problem. Thank you for having me. Um, so you can find Albacon at albacon.co.uk and from there you can get to our Facebook and Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at a second chapter, A2ND chapter. Um, and that's it. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. I will include direct links to all of that in the description of this episode on YouTube and if you're listening to the audio version in the, the podcast description. So yeah, head there and go click a click on, on all of that Thanks again. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.